Hi, everybody. My name is Cecilia. I am one of the Ho Family Student Guides at the Harvard Art Museums. And hi, everyone. My name is Paul. I am also a Ho Family Student Guide at the Harvard Art Museums. And today, July 19th, is the 84th anniversary of the opening of the Antarctica Kunst, or Degenerate Art, exhibition organized by the Nazi Party. We thought we would mark this rather grim occasion by discussing the history and context of this exhibition, as well as its ongoing relevance today. The Bush Reisinger Museum is the only museum in North America to be devoted primarily to the art of German speaking Europe, so we think the collection is uniquely poised to be a resource in this area. That's right, so this term degenerate art, which of course is a bit jarring and uncomfortable to use, refers to a particular aspect of Nazi art policy in the 1930s. So in 1937, the Nazis held an exhibition called Antarctica Kunst, which roughly translates to degenerate art in the city of Munich. And the goal of this exhibition was to mock and humiliate the work of many German artists from the first several decades of the 20th century. The Nazis rejected modern art and particularly works by the German expressionists on ideological grounds claiming that they were symptomatic of racial and cultural decline. And the show was actually planned as a counterpoint to the great exhibition of German art, which took place basically across the street and highlighted works that the Nazis deemed to be more in keeping with an Aryan sensibility. But one might be tempted to ask, what then was degenerate art? Um, and this is actually kind of a tricky question to answer. Although the campaign was very closely influenced by the Nazis' ideas about race and the publication of a key book connecting art with racial science just a few years prior, it might be surprising to some people that very few of the artists featured in the degenerate art exhibition were actually Jewish. If anything, this whole exhibition was much more of a way to punish collectors and critics and dealers rather than um, the art or the artists themselves. Many of the works that did end up being included in the exhibition were by some of the most prominent artists working in Germany at the time, um, often modern artists and uh, primarily German expressionists. At the same time, though, there was extensive debate amongst the Nazis themselves. For instance, Joseph Goebbels, who became one of the driving forces behind this campaign and this exhibition, had been an avid collector of modern art right before it launched. Also, as part of this sort of disorganized conception, the degenerate art exhibition was never really well thought through. It was actually put together very hastily in just 10 days. And the works for the show were selected right before the opening in July 1937. It was sort of a, a last minute add-on to frame, again, in opposition to the exhibit across the street. And at the same time, although we we're talking today about the degenerate art exhibition in Munich, it's important to remember that this is only one aspect of a much larger Nazi campaign against modern art, though again, it was never totally about style. And, and so the Degenerate Art Exhibition in the summer of 1937 followed in the footsteps of many smaller exhibitions that had come before. Under Hitler, there were thousands of works that were confiscated from private and public collections, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20,000. And only a small fraction of these were actually in the ex exhibition in 1937. That was in particular works that had come from public collections. Thousands of other works were sold off to collectors abroad, most famously during a series of auctions in Lucerne, Switzerland in 1939. In fact, actually some of the most famous works in the Harvard Arts Museum's collections were auctioned off as part of that. One of the most unsavory aspects of this already horrible story is also that about 5,000 works of art were actually systematically destroyed as well in a massive burning that took place at the Berlin Firehouse. And of course, that was paralleling the Nazis' book burnings and other destructive acts. Right, we have to recognize that aesthetics here were very much marshaled in service of ideology. And although this might all seem wholly foreign or outrageous to us, strands of the Nazi rhetoric exhibit unsettling parallels with some of what we can hear today. In his speech at the opening of the exhibition, Hitler stated that, quote, Works of art which cannot be understood in themselves but need some pretentious instruction book to justify their existence will never again find their way to the German people, end quote. 
And this charge of pretension certainly didn't form the primary core of the Nazi campaign against modern art, but it is uncontestably reflective of the broader narrative that they spun about the harmful cultural supremacy of Jewish people. The implication there is that the pretentious elites have pulled the wool over the public's eyes, obfuscated their, their understanding of what real art is. And perhaps most chillingly, this kind of sounds like something we might still hear today, this assertion that modern and contemporary art is too hard to understand, that it is pretentious and therefore objectionable in some way. I sometimes see statements online that all contemporary art is just a money laundering scheme or that it's some kind of collusion between financial elites and academia. And I'm obviously not saying that everyone who dislikes 20th and 21st century art is akin to a Nazi, but I think we need to recognize the lineage of statements like these and understand their very real potential to act as extremely damaging dog whistles. And I think to that point, the Nazis were by no means the first or the last group to target an artistic style for political motives on such a large scale. Obviously, the context is very different here, but one thing that has really shaken the art world to its core is an exec executive order by Donald Trump, which he issued during his presidency, which aimed to make neoclassical architecture the official style of government buildings. And again, this is obviously quite different. And at first glance, it might even seem sort of non-threatening. But as you dig into the text of this executive order and what it's trying to do, it be, something very ugly comes out. So once again, in this executive order, there's an attempt to frame a sort of moral hierarchy between styles, between different types of art and architecture for political and ideological purposes. And at the same time, some of those charges of pretension and elitism are again leveraged for, for political gain. So in Trump's executive order, there's a passage talking about modernist architecture in federal buildings that reads, it sometimes impresses the architectural elite, but not the American people who the buildings are meant to serve. But the point is, this kind of rhetoric is still very present. I mean, these people aren't trying to model themselves on this, but there, there are, there's a through line. Obviously, it's okay to not like certain types of art or architecture or to prefer others more. The problem is once we start grouping things into the simplistic categories of good and bad on a really large scale like this, or saying that this is beautiful and this is hideous, it somehow inspires bad virtues, things start to get pretty dangerous. The flip side of that is too, it's, it's also dangerous to make a certain artistic movement into a sort of hero. In the, in the aftermath of the De Degenerate Art Exhibition, just as the Nazis had sort of cast out a lot of these artists and, and looked down upon them, the United States really seized upon that and wanted to elevate these people, put them on a pedestal, bought a lot of the works that were sold off from Germany, framed them as anti-fascist in a sort of simplistic good guys, bad guys story. But as we'll see in another chat later this week, that was really not a reflection of reality on the ground. Right, absolutely. Oftentimes when the story of the degenerate art exhibition and the Nazi campaign against modern art does get discussed, the complexity of the whole situation can be too easily whittled down to a reductive narrative about how anti-fascist modern art was saved by, you know, the valiant Americans who saw the true value of the works. Um, and admittedly, the story is so shocking and upsetting, of course, that sometimes it is much more comforting to accept this as more or less the simple truth. But I think in order to be responsible stewards of art history, we have to engage with a profound and unyielding moral grayness of many facets of this story. Uh, for instance, the international institutions, including American institutions, who purchased the auctioned works uh, undoubtedly saved them and made it possible for subsequent generations to learn about and learn from these works. Uh, but in order to do so, these institutions had to knowingly give money to the Nazi regime. And again, the impulse, as Paul was saying, uh, to paint these persecuted artists as heroic anti-fascists is in some cases, not only reductive or overly simplistic, but outright false. The artist uh, Emil Nolde, for instance, was an early supporter of the Nazis, and in fact, a member of the Nazi party. Uh, later this week, Paul will discuss the particular case of Nolde with Lynette Roth, head of the Division of Modern Contemporary Art and Daimler Curator of the Bush Reisinger Museum, and um, unpack the complexity of that story a little bit more. So in closing, when we talk about the Nazis and we talk about something like the Degenerate Art Campaign, 
there's often a sort of temptation to sort of sensationalize it or focus on the gory details of it. But in the end, we need to remember that things are always much more complicated than that. Right, exactly. We have to be careful to not get caught up into the thrill of talking about this as though it is a historical event perfectly removed from the present moment. And realize instead that these sort of these sorts of strategies of using style, of using aesthetics as a proxy for politics are really not so far away from us as they might first seem. They're very much present in our current moment. And these kinds of strategies very much make themselves known. Um, I think we have to make an effort not to distance ourselves from stories like this and, and understand, again, the complexity and the difficulty of, of navigating them in the moment. Exactly. So with that in mind, throughout this week, we're going to be working to highlight different aspects of that story. Keep an eye out for future posts about works in the Harvard Art Museum's collection that were caught up in this and the, the effects of this that continue to this day. All right. So with that, thank you very much for listening and stay tuned.